How are you guys today? Awesome. Do you guys want to stand with us? It makes me less nervous. <laughs> Father God, thank you, Lord, so much for just being the remedy, Father God, to so many things um, that's wrong in this world. Um, we're able to look to you. We're able to put our hope and our trust in you. Um, thank you, Lord, for um, just being who you are, Father God, being the Father um, constantly loves us, be sending your Son to be our Savior, Father God. Um, I pray that you just... Um, Open our hearts as we um, listen to the speaker um, share your word uh, today, Father God. I pray that you just uh, bless today's meeting. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I know it was only one song. They're coming back. Just, just be patient. Um, I'm going to start off the meeting differently, as you've already noticed. I'm going to invite someone else to come up right now. Uh, she's a psychology professor here, so if any of you need to take a psych class, you should take it with her, because she's fantastic. Um, so Susan Siao is going to come up right now. It's her right here, Susan Siao. Oh, yeah. There we go. She's going to talk to you guys right now. Okay, do you have my slide? Anyway, 
Hi, everybody. I am here to talk to you about an event that's coming up on May 20th, and it is called the Favorite Faculty Luncheon. In other words, bring your favorite faculty member to lunch. And I'm going to first tell you what the event is going to be about, and then I will tell you how you can get involved. Okay, so first of all, what is it? It is an opportunity for you to reach out to one of your favorite faculty members and invite them to join you for lunch at Kellogg West, which is here on campus. There's a buffet lunch up there. It's really nice spread, really nice meal. And we're going to have a speaker. Her name is Dr. Mary Poplin. She's an education professor at Claremont Graduate uh, University. She is a much sought after speaker uh, for Christian events. And we are just so blessed that she's agreed to come and talk to us. She's going to be sharing about her experiences when she was on sabbatical. She went to Calcutta, and she worked with Mother Teresa. And that has really informed her ministry on campus at CGU. Um, the title of her talk is Mother Teresa teaches a, teaches a Professor About Her Calling. And I think any professor, no matter what their background, will be really interested in what she has to say. And, and what she's going to say is going to be really inspiring as well. So uh, anyway, that's the overall, uh, that's what it's about. Now let me tell you how you can get involved. You can prayerfully consider a favorite faculty member that you can invite to this event. And we have a sign-up sheet in the back. It's going to be back there for the next three weeks. Our RSVP date, which is very firm, is May 9th. Uh, let's see. Uh, so you go back there, you sign up. And um, by giving us your name and your email, um, we can add you to the evite. Then what you do is you'll also get an invitation back there and some suggestions on how to approach your professor. We have that in a handout. You invite your professor. Hopefully your professor will say yes. And um, you know when you talk to them, you say, this is, um, I'm a member of a Christian club, and this is an event that I forgot to tell you. It's, it's crew, epic. Chi Alpha and Korean Campus Crusade for Christ. So it's four clubs getting together for this event. So anyway, you the professor will know that it's a Christian event, and even if they say no, uh, you've already opened a doorway for communication about spiritual things because you've let them know that you're a Christian. So I think that's awesome, even at, um, of itself. So uh, let's see. The next question would be, oh, I'm on a tight budget. I'm a student you know, which we all understand. Well, you know, we are so blessed, everybody. There is a professor, his name was Eric Nielsen. He was a p agronomy professor at the University of Kansas, or I'm sorry, Kansas State University. And um, he's passed away, but when uh, he was on, on faculty there at Kansas State, he was involved in crusade. He was their faculty advisor. And he um, also started the faculty Christian ministry there on that campus. So he really had a heart for serving the Lord in the university. So in his memory and in his honor, his family gives out an award every year. And we are so blessed because Cal Poly Pomona got the award this year. But the stipulation is that uh, you have to use the award to minister to faculty. And that is why we are going to have this favorite faculty event. So I challenge you to think of a professor that you can invite. I want to end with one last thing. The speaker, Dr. Mary Poplin, she has a published autobiography. So what I'm going to say right now is not a secret. She, ha she led a very, very dark life before she became a Christian. And she had a student in her class. And that student just wanted to share with share the gospel with her that student went to her office hours pursued her gave her a bible prayed for her and that student was instrumental in uh, mary poplin's conversion um, and coming to know the lord so you know you just never know y'all so i just um, want to challenge you so thank you you guys i really recommend doing this event I know teachers are scary, and they seem like they know everything, but they're just people. And then if you go and you start talking to them about Jesus, and they're like, start bringing up crazy questions, just get humbled. You'll learn. It's okay. And you just bring them to this event. Dude, it's straightforward. Most teachers are going to be like, all right, sounds good. So just go for it. Be bold. Ta-da. It's starting to make sense. So anyways, 
If you don't know already, this is the Campus Crusade for Christ weekly meeting. We are a group of students who love people, love Jesus, and want to give everyone, including teachers, the opportunity to know him. Okay? So, see? We're, do, we're actively following that statement. We don't just say it and then don't do anything with that. Okay? We follow that thing. Does that? Yeah, it's just a couple things. But, yeah, no. That's what we do. So go for it. All right? Does that make sense? You guys are all tired again. I am, whenever I'm up here, I always I judge you guys based on your moods, nothing else. But then when you guys aren't smiling, you guys look angry and cranky, and then I feel uncomfortable because I'm staring at a bunch of mad people. Thank you, Johnny Ty. He's been here a while. He knows how it works. He knows how to make me happy. So men's and women's time. There's a video that's going to be coming up, okay? So I want you guys to be very attentive to this video. I think you stand men of the West! And tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! Welcome back, guys, to part seven of our Q&A with K-squared. K-squared. Okay, first question. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you do if your dog started laying eggs? What wouldn't I do? Carrie, what is your favorite couch? All of it. Next question. Okay, what is the best way to throw a dart? Like this! Do you have any sweet dance moves to teach us? Duh. So unnatural, Peter Gabriel. <laughs> so that helps me. <laughs> so if you don't know, Men's time consists of us beating each other up till we're dead. And women's time consists of a pretty awesome panel of people that will be answering all of your questions <laughs> that you obviously need answered. And dance lessons, apparently. So, no, it's, it's a really cool time for guys to just chill with each other and bond and grow. And, yeah, it's a little emotional sometimes, guys. I know we don't have emotions, so. And for girls, it's fun because, like, you guys really do just get to share, grow with each other. It's fun. All right, you guys, you guys already know this stuff. Okay. I'm not going to keep going into it. I'm getting, like, this look from three, so, like, I know. Okay, stop. So I'm going to stop. Remember dinners for eight? Yeah, dinners for eight, right? Do you remember that? How many people go? <laughs> Seventeen, sometimes. It can. Yeah, fill in the blank. If you want to go eat dinner with us, just sign up in the back, and you'll be able to hang out, eat dinner, and play games. We always play Hot Seat, which is a really fun game where you just get asked a bunch of questions and you have to bare your soul to everyone. So it's not uncomfortable at all. It's not weird or awkward. No, I'm just kidding. But it's uh, it's going to be May or no, April 20, uh, 30th. Sorry. I'm doing terrible today. I'm off my game, although I don't really have any. So um, April 30th, that's going to be happening. Sign up in the back. Remember Zombies versus Humans now? Oh, did anyone watch that movie after I recommended it? Three people? Okay, cool. Now you know how I feel. I love that movie. Um, so how many of you own a bandana in your wardrobe? Okay, how many of you need to buy a bandana now if you're going to play Zombies vs. Humans? Because if you signed up and you don't own a bandana, raise your hand because you got to get one because that's how we're going to determine who's a zombie who's not. But if you're like a human and you don't plan on ever getting bitten, just fine. Be cocky. Don't get a bandana. And when you get bit, don't come crying to me that you need an extra bandana. I would ask Carrie. Um, so ask Carrie after the meeting if you have any further questions pertaining to it because I am out of the circle of information. Carrie's going to set this all up for you. So thank her. She's been doing a great job doing this. And, uh, yeah, prepare for crazy chaos and apocalypse-ness. Yeah, don't worry. Just sign up. The last day to do that is the 25th. 
Right. After that, no game for you if you miss one. Grounds tonight, that is at Pomona First Baptist. It will not be at my house this time, so don't show up because we will not cater to your every needs, maybe. Um, we probably will. Uh, so, but just, you know, we're, what, are, what we're going to do tonight, um, I have Passion of the Christ written down. So you can only imagine what that means. It's going to be a very intense time tonight. Yes? Yeah? It's going to be okay. So don't don't come and, like, expect it to just be, like, a dreary kind of, you know, mo. mo I am not on my game. <laughs> a dreary kind of mood for the evening. Uh, it's There's going to be a lot of cool things that are going to go with it. So show up. It's not just going to be the movie and then that's it. So, okay? Um, Who knows how to get to PFB? If you don't know, find one of those people raising their hands. Okay, now I have our speaker. So it's going to get better right now because I'm going to be leaving. Um, this person has actually has been doing a series of competitions with another person in our movement, Caitlin Rogers. Um, and I believe she's only won one of these competitions. Yeah, so Caitlin's fantastic. So <laughs> just kidding. So our speaker is Amanda Gagnon. She's been on staff for a while. You can come up. I'm, I'm trying to talk as you make your way. Uh, she's been on staff for us for the year. She has a twin, and she really wanted me to sing you a song as she was coming up, but I'm not, because I can't sing. So here's Amanda. Hello. Okay, wait. I want to make sure. Stay on time. Um, yeah, so as Brock mentioned, I'm a twin. I'm an identical twin. And um, I've been on staff. This is my fifth year. It's not super long, but, you know, longer than a year or two. Just going to leave this like this. And so um, I actually, I wanted to sing the gaucho song because I graduated from UC Santa Barbara. You guys ever know, like, ole, 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 and you toss tortillas. That's as much as school spirit as we had at UCSB. <laughs> so I graduated from UCSB. I was involved in crew there as a student. And it was there that really God placed my heart. Um, just the passion for college ministry. And so right after graduation, I graduated in 2006. I joined staff that summer. And I've been at, UC well, I was at UCLA for three years. And then this year, this um, earlier in the fall, I transitioned here. So I've been here for almost a year. Um, and it's just been, it's been awesome. God's continually teaching me things and growing my heart for college ministry. So it's been great. I'm going to lower this just. You actually see my face. <laughs> but um, to get you a little bit of glimpse of my life, um, you know, Earth Day is coming up. I actually don't know exactly when it is, or it's already passed. Tomorrow. Okay, perfect. So I want to let you know about a little bit of how I was when I was growing up. So I went through this save the earth, save the animals phase, and um, it was a huge phase. I had dreams of, like, trekking through the rainforest. In fact, I thought that would have been the best vacation ever. And I had this idea that I wanted to, like, make my room into a rainforest. Like, you know the Rainforest Cafe? Uh, that was not in existence when I was young. But if it was, I probably would have wanted to go there, like, all the time. I thought it was amazing. And so it was kind of during this time, I was about 10 years old. It was a phase that lasted through elementary school. My, my parents um, and my sister and I would always go on a camping trip. We'd go to camping trips every summer. We'd go to the National Forest. Um, and this particular year when I was 10, I went to the Redwoods. And so I was so excited. If you guys have ever been to the Redwoods, I went to Jedediah Smith Campground. And um, it's, it's, like a, it's seriously like you're walking into Jurassic Park. It looks prehistoric. And so I was so excited. And I was even more excited because <laughs> um, when we got into the park, the, the ranger station had these backpacks for kids that you could rent. And so... In the backpack were, you know, binoculars and these, like, bird identification books and water sampling kit and this huge thermometer. It was just filled with, with these things. So my dad surprised my sister and I. My sister could have cared less, but I was super excited with this backpack. And he kind of pulls aside and said, okay, there's things in this backpack that are kind of expensive, so you need to be responsible. You need to, be, you know, take care of it. And, but have fun. Go sample the water. Um, and have fun. So I was really, really excited about this. I couldn't wait to get in the backpack. So we're setting up camp, and, you know, I'm going through the backpack, and I, I see this thermometer. So this wasn't like any other thermometer. It was this huge thermometer in a plastic case, and, um, and it was attached to kind of a, a long string. 
and it's the, you know, that you can basically see how cold the water is. And so I thought it was so cool. And, you know, 30 minutes into it, my dad's, you know, setting up camp. I think people were gone. I start swinging this thermometer. And I'm just in my own little world swinging it. And, in fact, my aunt was with us on this trip. And she's like, you know, Amanda, you might not have swing, want to swing that. It could, you know, fly out of your hand and hit a rock. And I'm thinking, like, that's going to happen. You know, I have control. So literally she goes back. She had a motorhome in her motorhome. I'm alone, and I'm swinging this thermometer. And seriously, five seconds after she leaves, it flies out of my hand and hits, like, the smallest rock ever, okay? It, like, the only rock in the campsite. And so I sit there and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. And, um, and so I kind of slowly walk over, and I'm thinking, okay, it's in a plastic case. I'm fine. We're good to go. So I kind of slowly walk over, and I, I start to open the case. And I open it, and it's shattered in the case, okay? This is 30 minutes after I got the backpack, okay? <laughs> this isn't even, like, halfway through the week. And so my first thought is, I can't believe that just happened. And then my second thought is, I am in so much trouble. My dad is going to be so mad and so disappointed. So no one's around. So I'm thinking, maybe I can open it and, and try to put it, you know, glue it back together. I was desperate. And I'm thinking, that's just a stupid idea. And then I think, okay, maybe I can, you know, hide it and then make up this story something happened. And I was like, that's probably not the smartest idea because I'll probably get caught and I'll be even in even worse trouble. So I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking, I am gonna, I'm going to be in so much trouble. It was 30 minutes, no one's there. And I knew I had to tell my dad. And I was so scared to tell him. So I think back to the story, and it kind of reminds me, you know, it brings back good memories. I, I was just remembering it with my dad the other weekend. This is like I couldn't believe that. But um, it reminds me of ways in which I just tr want to try to fix myself. Like I want to try to fix things that are broken in my life and sit in my life. And I think that we can probably all relate to that instances um, where we've made maybe poor decisions or where things haven't gone as planned and we just want to fix it. And I think it reminds me of just even further my relationship with the Lord and how sometimes I on my own strength want to fix things and I don't want to leave it up to God. Um, and so even in continuing our series of Jesus is, I want us to consider even that Jesus is our hope and that he is our hope that we don't need to fix things, that we can't fix things in our own strength. Um, and even things that don't go as planned in our life, brokenness in our life, that it's through Jesus alone that we can hope in, and hope for. And as I was thinking through the series, you know, Jesus is hope, um, I was reminded of a story I studied this past summer. And it's a story found in 2 Samuel. Uh, it's a story of Mephibosheth and David, if you guys remember. It's, it's a short story. It's about 13 verses. And I love this story because it reminds me and it points me back to Christ. And it reminds me of the hope that we have found in Christ. So I think there's a slide with um, 2 Samuel 9, chapter 9, 1 to 13. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open. And we're going to read it real quick. It starts off, and David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul who was named Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there still not someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Who is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Makur, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Makur, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his faith and paid homage. Homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. And you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. 
but Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king commands his servant, so, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. And to give you a little bit of background um, from the story, um, the context is, is that the period of Judges has just ended, if you know anything about Judges. And Saul was Israel's first king. But what we know where this story takes place is Saul and his son Jonathan have died. And this place, the story takes place in David is king now. He's taken the throne. And so um, we know that Saul is um, Israel's first king. But what we also know is that David is Israel's ideal king. And it points Israel to their need for their perfect king, which is found in Jesus Christ. So it's through the story that we kind of see qualities of God um, of, and how David, David treats Mephibosheth. So a little bit, it, it's kind of interesting. It starts off, David asks, who, you know, is there any servant who I can show kindness to? And it's interesting because what we know is that Saul was David's enemy. Um, but what we also know is Saul's son, Jonathan, was one of David's dear friends. He was close to David. They shared everything. They were like brothers. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 20, we won't go there, but um, we see that David makes this covenant with Jonathan. And what he says is Jonathan knows that um, David's going to be king soon. He knows that Saul is going to, you know, he doesn't know they're going to die, but he's, he knows that he's going to um, basically not be king anymore. And so he's fearful. He, he fears that what will happen either to him or his, his children or anyone connected to his family. And so um, David promises Jonathan 15 to 20 years prior that he promises him um, that he will have kindness, he will have care and compassion for Jonathan's family. And so we see, you know, flash forward um, 20 years, we see that David is searching for anyone who survived um, in Saul's line so that he can fulfill this covenant that he makes, um, that he made with Jonathan. So both Saul and Jonathan have died, but he finds out that there's a servant, Ziba, and he calls Ziba in, and he says, you know, is there anyone left of Saul's house? Um, and Jonathan, and so Ziba's like, well, actually, there is a guy. His name is Mephibosheth. He's actually Jonathan's son. But he mentions that he's crippled. And so we kind of get this first insight into Mephibosheth's life, that he's crippled. And so you, we kind of wonder, okay, well, how did he become crippled? Was he born crippled? Actually, what happened was that when Mephibosheth was young, that's when Jonathan, had fought, his father, had died. And when the nurse taking care of Mephibosheth had found out, had gotten news that Jonathan had died and Saul had died, she was in fear. She was afraid of what would happen to both her and Mephibosheth. And so she grabs Mephibosheth and runs and escapes to Lodabar. But on their way, she drops him, and that's how he becomes crippled. So his physical state of being crippled and broken is a reminder of that fear, of that escape that he faces day after day after day. And we also know that he now, you know, they find him in Lodabar. And what we know of Lodabar is Lodabar is a dismal place. It's a place of desolation. It's basically a place of no hope. And so Mephibosheth's crippled state, his physical state, very much reflects where he's living. No one wanted to live in Lodabar. I kind of think of, and if you, you're from here, I'm so sorry, but of Needles, California. Have you guys ever been to Needles? I drive through Needles to visit my grandma in Arizona, and I just would never want to live in Needles. There's desert life in Needles, but it's really hot, and it's just there's not much going on there. And so I kind of think of Lodabar as this place. You know, he flees from Jerusalem, which is the promised land, very, um, you know, there's a lot of land, fruitful and everything. He's just in this desolate place. So we know he comes from there. Mephibosheth comes before David, and we see that he falls on his face um, in fear before David. He probably hears from Ziba, hey, David wants to show you kindness, but there's still anxiousness, there's still fear. And the reason is, is because historically there's this custom of bloodletting when um, kings would overtake the throne. And what that meant was that in, um, when a new king were to take the throne, anyone that was associated to the old king, a family or connected in some way, um, they would kill. 
because it would be a threat to the throne. In fact, this was considered something that was politically sharp. It was a smart move. And it was just so, you know, that the new king would take the throne. He would have no problems, um, no one kind of challenging his position, um, challenging his authority. So that would, it would have been, it would have looked like, yep, that's what you do. And Mephibosheth knew that. He knew that his life was in danger. However, we see that instead of killing Mephibosheth, David actually does the exact opposite. He spares his life. But not only that, I mean, if he would have spared Mephibosheth's life, that would have been incredible. But he goes above and beyond. He um, redeems him Saul's land. He says he gives him all this land. And not only that, he gives him Ziba and his servants, which equal 35, his sons and his servants, to serve Mephibosheth for the rest of his life. So he's taken care of. He's, his life is spared. He's taken care of. Um, he has plenty of food, plenty of people to take care of him since he's crippled. He can't take care of himself. And not only that, David promises that he will eat at his table and be treated like one of his sons for the rest of his life. So we just see this overwhelming <coughs> compassion and care that David shows Mephibosheth. And this word kindness, the Hebrew word for it is actually hesed. And, you know, when we think of someone, we say, oh, someone's kind. You know, we think of, um, oh, they're, they're really sweet. Well, this word hesed actually means a steadfast love. It's this love loyalty marked with faithfulness, compare, compassion, and care. And that's exactly what David shows Mephibosheth as he treats him. And in the same way, we're pointed to God. You know how David, the king, the ideal king, showed compa um, compassion and care for Mephibosheth. We're also shown compassion and care from the Lord. He represents Israel's ideal king. Christ represents our perfect king. And I, I love that part of it, how it just exactly reflects God's love, his kindness. In fact, in the Old Testament and all throughout, when it says God's kind, whatever it says is steadfast love, that same word hesed is used for God when, when it speaks about our relationship with him. And so it's a direct connection. The, the story wraps up, and we see that, you know, this, this guy who came from Lodabar, he was crippled, actually no hope. Um, he ends with having land, living in Jerusalem, being served by Ziba, um, and eating at the king's table. And so we see this guy who was a hopeless cripple from Lodabar. He is now a redeemed cripple um, with his identity being treated as one of the king's son. And we just see this dramatic change in his life. And I know that in the story I had mentioned that, you know, um, God's steadfast love for us, it's, it's a direct correlation to our lives. And the same way the story reminds me of God's kindness, his steadfast love in my own life. And I think the story just mirrors our relationship with God. You know, in the same way through Christ, as David redeemed Mephibosheth's life, as he showed compassion and care, as he saved his life, so too has Christ saved my life. Um, so too has he worked in my life, has he, he's redeemed my life, he's restored my life. Um, in the same way that um, David essentially adopted Mephibosheth as one of his sons, so too have us who've, who've accepted Christ in our life have been adopted into God's family, we're God's children. And I love that part of the story, and it's in that that I can have just tremendous hope that Jesus is my hope, no matter what circumstance in my life happens, no matter how I sin or um, what brokenness I face. And I let just, Jesus is our hope because it's through him we are adopted, we're accepted, we're provided for, and we are loved by our God. But even in the story, I think of, um, I, I, you know, I was saying the story, I think of, the, you know, but in Mephibosheth's life, like, there's things in my life that relate to Mephibosheth's physical state of being broken and of being crippled. You know, though Mephibosheth was restored, and though I know as a believer I'm restored and I'm redeemed, there's things in my life still that I can tend to go back to and actually operate as if, you know, I'm, you know, back in Lodabar, um, back as Mephibosheth as he was before. And I think in our, in our, all of our whole life, we can all see um, these reflections of brokenness in our life and these reflections of not going to the Lord. Um, for those of us who believe in God and who've professed our faith in Christ, going to him first above, above anything else. And so I ask myself, you know, why don't I embrace God's love in my life at times? Why don't I embrace his um, redemption? Um, why don't I place my hope in Christ rather than in things that ultimately will fail me every time? 
And so there's three reasons um, from even the story of Mephibosheth that I found of reasons why I don't run to Christ and embrace um, his love and his kindness um, first and foremost in my life. And the first reason, maybe you guys can relate, is that I can start to believe that there's fear in coming to God with my sin and with things that are broken in my life. Um, can you guys relate to that? Are there things in your life where you're like, wow, this just seems, whether it's in your past or even now, it just seems so beyond repair. Um, whether it's sin in your life or maybe circumstances um, with family or with friends or school or anything that just seem, they're just broken. And you're like, how is there hope in this? I think for me, you know, I can have a tendency to go back as if I'm still living in Lodabar. And I think it would be crazy, right, if Mephibosheth, after all that King David had said and had done, if Mephibosheth said, you know, thank you so much, King David, but I'm just going to go back to Lodabar. Um, uh, I'm more comfortable there. And I bet, you know, Lodabar was a desolate place, a broken place. I'm sure in Lodabar, Mephibosheth felt initially more comfortable. He felt like he belonged there. He fit in there. And he didn't probably feel as exposed in Lodabar as he felt exposed standing in front of this king. And I think in the same way, you know, we're not as, you know, we're exposed standing in front of our perfect king. But we're told in Hebrews that we can have confidence in approaching the throne of Christ because he is a God who has compassion on us, who loves us, that it doesn't matter our brokenness or our sin because we're not justified by that. We're justified by Christ alone. And I love that promise. I think I have to go back to that all the time when I can fall into starting to believe um, that, you know, there's fear in coming to God. There's no fear. Uh, in 1 John 4.18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And I love that it's in the cross that we've been perfected in love. You know, I love that um, it's in the cross where we have full love, full acceptance, um, that we can approach God with confidence, knowing that he, he cares for us, he loves us, and that he himself redeems us alone. So even where, you know, is there fear in your life? Where is there fear that's preventing you from coming before God, coming before Christ and running to him alone? <coughs> the second reason I see in Mephibosheth's story, where sometimes I don't run to Christ and embrace his loving kindness and his grace in my life, is because sometimes I can tend to believe or start to believe that godly growth is up to me. Have you guys ever, when you were growing up, had the gold stars in elementary school? Where every time you did something nice, whether it's, you know, cared for a friend or you served, helped the teacher, you got a gold star. Maybe you got an A in that test, you got a gold star. Well, there's that chart with a gold star, but there's also, do you guys remember the blackboard or maybe in your case the whiteboard where your name went when you did something wrong and you got a check or a slash? Yeah, I remember that very well. And so you like, it's like right next to like this beautiful gold star chart was your name with check marks, right? And I went to a private school um, when I was really young, and you got a check mark for everything. I mean, I dropped my pencil one time, and I got a check mark. Um, and so, <laughs> and so um, you know, I feel like sometimes in my life, there's a battle between the stars and the slashes. You know, sometimes I can think like, okay, yep did well, you know, I read the Bible, spent time with the Lord, um, I was patient with this person, or even like, I did well on this job, I got the A on this class, um, I got the A in this test, and it being a battle, because there's also the other side, where like, oh, you know, I did this wrong, oh man, I totally snapped at my roommate, or oh, I just fell again in this sin I've been struggling with over and over again, or even brokenness in our life that you have no control over. Sometimes I think we're in a battle of the stars and slashes. But I think I'm reminded that, you know, no matter how hard I try, I can't produce genuine change in my own life. Um, and all this leads to the stars and slashes is a life of defe defeat and frustration. Um, you know, I can, I can always look to the gold star chart, um, but I'll always be reminded of the slashes on that blackboard. And I think in our life as believers, we can tend to justify ourselves by the good we do, but we're never justified by that, as Mephibosheth wasn't justified as well. I know I'm reminded that my hope is in the gospel. Um, from the time I first accepted Christ, all throughout my whole life. I love, I've heard this, you know, you never graduate from the gospel. 
that I need the gospel in my life as much as I did that first moment when I invited Christ to my heart, every single moment of my life, because it's the gospel that we're giving grace. And I love that part. So even if I ask you guys, you know, what are your gold stars and what, have your, what are your blackboard slashes? And what do you need to bring before the Lord? The third reason and last reason um, that times where I don't run to Christ and embrace his loving um, grace and his loving kindness is because I can start to believe that my own efforts will give me greater acceptance by God and others. You know, my hope can be placed in others' opinions of myself, um, of me, and I can really fall into this, you know, whether it's a ministry or anything else. Like, I sometimes just want people to like me and people to agree with me. And I don't know if you guys can relate to that at all, um, but I think I can have a tendency to put my hope in what other people think and how other people experience me. And I think God brings me back continually through th- to that, that, you know, my hope is not in others' acceptance of me, but my hope is that Christ already accepts me. He already has adopted me as his child. I've heard this before. I love this. He says, you know, there are, God will not love you any less than he already does, and he, can't, he cannot love you any more than he already has. And I love that, that, um, you know, we're not justified, again, by what we do, by other people's acceptance, um, by our credentials, by our resume, you name it. We're justified by Christ, and we're loved by Christ. And I love that my hope um, is in Christ because it's there that I'm, I'm loved and accepted. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, when Mephibosheth asked David, why would you show regard to me? I'm a dead dog. He's asking the wrong question because we know that, you know, David didn't show regard to Mephibosheth because of what Mephibosheth had done. He was in line of his enemy, but he showed regard to him because of the covenant, the promise he made with Jonathan. Just like God shows regard for us through the covenant he's made and through Jesus Christ alone. It's not by anything we do. God came down to us through Christ. There is no way before we're a believer to earn our way. There's no way while we're a believer to earn our way and to earn greater acceptance to Christ. So the question is, where do you go for acceptance? Um, And I I love the cross. It's a beautiful picture because it's at the cross where we receive full forgiveness. And not only that, but we we receive full acceptance. And for me, I think that's where I can have a deep and unwavering hope. I had mentioned before that, um, you know, I was standing there in the campsite for 30 minutes that felt like five hours. And I, um, I was just waiting for my dad, and I was just, gosh, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine what he was going to say. I knew he was going to get frustrated and really upset. So I was just waiting there. So finally my dad appears. He's setting up camp, and his back is to me, and I kind of slowly walk over with his broken thermometer in my hand. And um, I had, like, this shaky voice, like, Dad? And he turns around, and he totally knows something's wrong. He's like, what's wrong? And I just, like, break down. Like, I broke the thermometer. He's like, how? He's like, I was swinging it. <laughs> like, this confession. And um, so he just kind of takes a deep breath. But the, the great thing was in that moment, you know, he did not yell at me. He just kind of gathered me in his arms. He said, you know, um, it's going to be okay. You know, I still love you. You'll always be my daughter. And I think back to that story because how much more does Christ still love us? Does Christ accept us? How much more has he given us his kindness, this grace that we don't have to earn it? We don't have to um, try really, really hard. We've already been given it. It's by grace alone. How much more like how David showed kindness to Mephibosheth, how David redeemed Mephibosheth, has Christ redeemed us? And so I just hope even after even after reading the story that in your lives, whether it's brokenness or sin or anything, that you will feel confident in coming before the Lord um, and just surrendering everything to him and confident in just accepting um, that you're a daughter and a son of the Lord, um, that you would grow and understand even more deeply his intimacy um, in your life and his love and acceptance for you. So let me close this in prayer. God, I thank you for the reminder of, through the story of David and Mephibosheth, of how you absolutely love us, God, that there's nothing that we've done to earn um, your salvation. There's nothing we've done to earn your forgiveness, your acceptance. And God, I just pray that this will become a deeper truth in our lives. Even every moment of our life, I know I'm still learning. God, growing in that, God, I pray for these students that you will grow them um, in this deep understanding. And it's out of that, our relationship with you, um, where your love and mercy and grace will flow. God, we give you today, and thank you just for the time that we can gain your word um, and learn more about you. And we pray, amen.
think I'm gonna get another one. <laughs> uh, we're just gonna do it again. We're just gonna do one of the first songs. You guys wanna work with it now? Father God, thank you, Lord, so much for this second chance. Lord, we've messed up so many times. A thousand times we've messed up, Father God, but you still will remain with us, um, loving us with open arms, Father God. I just thank you, Lord, so much for that redeeming love. And um, I just thank you, Lord, for um, the words that you've spoken to us, Father God, that we may take it uh, to heart and live it out, Father God, uh, that you are our hope. Have a good week. Oh. <laughs> We're going to Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A for And lunch. if you guys announcements? Oh, yeah. Um, 
announcements in the back, like we're not going to repeat them. Just check the back for sign up sheets and stuff. Yes, yeah, zombies versus humans. Dinners for eight. Browns tonight. Men, men versus, men men versus <laughs> women's time. 